Hey everyone, it's time for part three of the how to play the Tomb Raider card game series. In part two, we looked at how you can construct your deck and what cards are necessary in order to play. Now in part three, we're going to talk about how to get started. So the first thing you're going to want to do is to decide what level you are going to play. You could decide to play the deck, like a custom deck that you've created, or you could choose to play one of the quest decks, which you can purchase separately. Or alternatively, you can look to the instruction guide or my document in the comments, which has some pre-curated levels. So if we go to the back of the instruction booklet, you have some levels which tell you how many players they are, how difficult the level is, which cards you use in the level deck, and then how to actually lay out the map and what the goal is. So there are quite a few pre-constructed levels for you. You've got the introductory level, which is like a tutorial. I would highly recommend playing this solo first to make sure that you understand the mechanics of the game. Then there's also the Into the Caves and Trapped in the Tombs levels, which of course are quest deck levels. There's also Death by Design, which actually has a specific layout curated for you based on the two quest decks. So you can see those level cards just there. There's also Freestyle. Technically, freestyle is you playing your own level, but they have a specific definition of the word freestyle, which tells you which ones to use and how to play. There's a level called Parallel Peril and Parallel Pickup. I'd be interested to give these a try. They seem quite uh, complicated, but interesting. There's Atlantis, which is similar to the deck that I have constructed, although mine's a bit more custom than this. Then there's Explore the Depth, and it talks about variant level goals as well. So that's the first thing. It's deciding what level you're actually going to play. Technically, your location deck and your draw deck are two different things. So you and a friend could have two draw decks, and then you'd both be playing from the same location deck. That's the first thing you need to decide before you play. So in my case, I'm going to be using my Atlantis level, and I'm going to be doing it at a maximum depth of 6, and a column width of three. So I've got my depth tracker here. That's my level. Next is to choose your raider. So I've chosen Lara Croft Duelist for this deck. Um, you can choose any of the Lara Croft raider cards or the alternative raiders. Um, that I know there's quite a lot in the expansions. In the base set, it's things like Cowboy, the Bold Man, Skateboard Kid, etc. But I'm going to go with Lara Croft Duelist, and that is my Raider for this deck. I briefly touched upon in the previous video what these four numbers here are, but I will reiterate those now. So when deciding which Raider to use, you want to be looking at their abilities. There are four ability scores in the game, and they will be used in tests throughout the game. So that will be where you will be asked to roll dice corresponding to these numbers here to overcome a certain score. A bit like a DC in Dungeons and Dragons if you play that. So the top number, the red one, is fight and I have a value of 3. The blue one, second one down, is run and I have a value of 2. The green one, third one down, is search and I have a value of 2. And then the yellow one, the last one on the list, is think and I have a value of Free. So these values generally are used for the different kinds of tests. So you might be asked by an obstacle card or a location card to complete a test. For example, the pit trap obstacle says 9 move or 10 search. Now that is the total dice roll amount that you need in order to succeed. And if you don't, you are stuck. And we'll talk about impairments in a later video. So these numbers here are the number of dice you would roll for each of these tests. So I need to get a 9 in move or a 10 in search. So unfortunately, both of my move and search numbers are only two, which means I can only roll two dice. So if that being the case, I'm better off trying the move one because it's going to be easier to get a nine than a 10 with two dice. So I would take my two dice and I would roll them. And you can see in this case, I actually rolled 10, which means that I would succeed at this obstacle and avoid being stuck. So that's what the abilities mean. Also to consider when choosing a raider is that some raider cards do have special abilities. For example, the Lara Croft Mariner card says to roll an additional die while making a test at a wet location. Again, we'll cover Slippery When Wet in a later video, but just something to bear in mind. Let's talk about life slash health. It's officially called life in the game, so we're going to be calling it life in this video. So your raider has maximum life and you'll see it's not actually mentioned on the card at all. So a little bit convoluted, but your maximum life is equal to your lowest ability score. So in this case, both of my lowest scores are two. So Lara Croft has a maximum life of two. 
You can get injured in the game, which reduces the value of your ability scores. And if your ability score lowers, then your maximum life will lower as well, assuming it was your lowest one. For example, if I get a search injury, I'm not sure how that works, but say that I do, and that goes down to one, then my maximum life has also reduced to one. If any of these ability scores get reduced to zero by injuries, then your maximum life is zero and your character dies. So when it comes to life, you can heal any hits that you've taken using cards like Medipacks, but you can't heal above your maximum life. So if your maximum life is two, then you can only have two life. Similarly to injuries, if you are able to increase your abilities, then your as long as your lowest ability has gone up, then your maximum life would go up. So if I'm able to get my run and my search ability up by one, then I can have a maximum life of three, which would be pretty good. For context, most of the creatures that you will face only have a life of one or two. In some cases, they'll have life of three. And most raiders have a maximum life of two because their lowest score will be two on their card. So just something to bear in mind. All right, we've got our level deck, we've got our depth tracker, and we have our raider, also our instructions, but I'm gonna put them to one side. Now it's time to actually put together the game field. First things first, you're gonna to need to consider how much space you're gonna need on the table. You're gonna be laying out this depth tracker to as far as this level can go. So I've chosen a depth, maximum depth of six for my level. So it's gonna go all the way up here and outside of the viewfinder of the camera. I don't actually have enough space on this desk for that, so I would need to use a bigger table to do that. Each column is going to need to be about two cards wide so that you can play obstacle cards and you can rotate the cards. So you're gonna to need to consider that when you're deciding what level to play. I'm going with three columns of cards with a depth of six. First thing you need to do is put down your entrance card. In solo play, the entrance card always goes in the bottom left, so that's at a depth of one and in the first column. If you are playing in multiplayer, usually if it's two players, which I would personally recommend no more than two, you can play with more than two, but it just gets really confusing. If you're playing in two player, you would have a second entrance in the bottom right. So. This isn't an entrance card, but if it was, we would say this is column number three, that is the bottom right, and that is where they would start. But for now, this is our solo entrance, and I'm going to put my little raider figure on there to say that's where I'm starting. Once you have that done, you're going to need to take your level deck and shuffle them. If you are playing a pre-constructed level, you might be told which levels to put down and where, or which locations rather. Um, it might be that the treasure room is a known location, in which case you would take that out of the level deck before shuffling. But I have shuffled the location deck and then it's gonna go over here in reach of all players. You also need to make sure you have room for a discard pile as well. This is because some location cards have requirements, so you can't place them on certain depths which is the depth tracker over here. In that case, you would have to discard it and then it can get shuffled back in later on. So this is what the play space will look like. As you play, you will be placing down locations like this. So this one would go at depth two in this direction. And then I could put this one down over here as my raider is exploring these locations. Also bear in mind that you'll have to be able to rotate the cards depending on which way you're going. And when we get to the game rules, we'll be doing that. But that's roughly what this sort of area of the game will look like. Next, we're gonna talk about your personal player area. So both players will need their own personal play area. And this is where they're going to have their Raider card and then any other cards they're going to be playing. So first of all, your draw deck will need to be somewhere in this area. If you're playing solo, then take your obstacle cards and put them to one side and they will make an obstacle deck. If you're playing in multiple player then your obstacle cards would go into your draw deck. Shuffle your draw deck, make sure that it's shuffled well and the rules say that your opponent can split the deck as well that's probably good practice. So I would have my draw deck just to the left of my raider card with space for a discard pile underneath. Next that as mentioned we have the raider card and then I would have upgrade cards underneath. So for example, if I drew Lara Croft Adventurer and I met the requirements to play it, which is play when you save your character, I would put it down underneath the raider so that I have clear view of both cards. So it says here, upgrade any adventurer, add plus one to each ability that started the game at less than three. So this is actually a great example of what I was talking about with life. This would increase my run and my search abilities to three, which would increase my maximum life to three. So 
Good example. So that's where my raider is, that's where my upgrades are. We've got draw deck and a discard pile. Then over on the right side are going to be your saved item discoveries and your unsaved item discoveries. So what do I mean by that? So here is my hand of cards. I've got magnum pistols, small medipack, large medipack, and a save point. So if I complete a search in an area and I get a 15 or above, I can use my magnum pistols. These are a weapon which add plus one to your fight results and plus one hit when you cause damage. If I were to play these right away, they would go into this row down here, which are my unsaved item discoveries. So these are items that are going to be used with my raider when I play, but if I die, then I did not save these items, so they would go. I would be discarding them, unfortunately, and I'd have to start again. If there is a save location, or if I was to put a save point on a location, I can choose to save my character. And when I save my character, any unsaved items like this get moved up to the saved items. And in this row of cards, anything that's here will retain once I die. So if my character dies or is reset, I will still keep all the cards up here, which is great. So you've got your level mapped out, you've got your draw deck and your player area all mapped out. The only other thing to talk about then is in solo play, as previously mentioned, your obstacle cards would be separated from the rest of your draw deck and used as an obstacle deck. So you would shuffle these cards however you want to do it, put them face down to one side, and then every time you explore a new area, you would draw one obstacle card and place that on your location but more on that when we come to playing the game. Before you can begin you need to choose a starting hand so that's one thing that's interesting again about this game is you get to choose the cards in your starting hand. Your starting hand, the number of cards that you can draw, is equal to your think ability. So Lara Croft Duelist has a number of three so I can go through my draw deck and choose whatever three cards I want to be my starting hand. I did briefly touch upon this earlier but I'm just going to reiterate it now to make sure it's absolutely clear. When you move to a location, the arrows do matter. So if you see this tomb entrance card here, you can go up, right, and left. So let's say my character starts on the tomb entrance. If I were to go left, the new location card that I draw from here needs to match that arrow. So I'll put this down here, and the bottom of the card, the, I guess, uh, south facing arrow points in the direction that you came from. So I came from this way so I've turned the card 90 degrees clockwise and you can see that that arrow points back that way. And then from here I can obviously follow the arrows in this direction unless it will take you off of the map. So because we're at depth one at the moment I can't go down here because that would be depth zero. If I, I was over here and this was the this was not an active column, then I wouldn't be able to put a card here either. It's worth noting as well that if you go into a location, it doesn't necessarily need to have a south-facing arrow. This could be because you've fallen down a trap or it is a, a dead end where there's no way to go back. One thing to bear in mind as well is that some actions and obstacles can actually add exits or block e exits on your cards. So if we have a look at the crawler range card here, you can see it doesn't have a north facing exit, but it might be that I use a hidden exit card and that allows me to add an arrow to that one. So we have the arrow pieces that were included with the game. We can put that arrow over there. So now we know that it has a north facing exit. Similarly, you can have cards that actually block exits and that would be when we use this cross arrow. So say that it's blocking the left exit, I would put that over the arrow and now we know we can't go that way. We can only go these two directions. All right, so that's everything for the setup stage. So the last thing to do then is to talk about how you actually play the game. So that will be in the next video. Thanks very much for watching and I'll catch you on that one. Thanks so much for watching. If you'd be interested in more videos like this, please click the subscribe button down below and give me a thumbs up to let me know that you enjoyed this video.